Well, all I can say, man, is be careful what you ask for. If you got, got more snow, didn't you? Oh, we got about <laughs> 10, 10 to 12 inches of snow. Today it's about <laughs> man. minus two. And my poor little dog, Maddie, running through that snow is, is a sight to behold. I bet it is. It's, it's taller a good than her legs. She loves it, kind of, but not really. Yeah, uh, waffles. We had, you know, we had snow last week. It's, I ran outside this morning. It was two uh, yesterday. It was beautiful, I mean, legit beautiful here on Saturday. Like in the 50s, we were outside and then woke up Sunday morning, negative 10. I was like, what the hell is going on here? But when it snowed, waffles came outside on the patio and he did not know what to do. He was like, I don't know where to pee. I don't know what to do. I don't yeah. see any grass. Right. He like leapt from the patio um like 20 feet acting like he was going to go somewhere different than right in the snow but he was yeah he was uncertain but then once he got in there loved it uh, and there, there really is nothing better than a uh, senior dog happy running through the snow but it's sunshine here I hope it's sunshine where you are it's the last day of the month the first month of 2023 it's january 31st 2023 welcome aboard everybody listen to the crushing iron podcast episode 655 yeah man it's uh a six double nickel. Jan six double nickel. Yeah, double January nickel. in the books. Uh, in the books, a, flow, uh, it flew by. It flew by. Um, how does it do that? Well, because everybody's hunkering down, ready for you know a brand year, new uh, new year, new them, and that's what happens when you uh, get rock and rolling and you're pumped for a for a month. It's just busy, right? You you, you don't do too much. Over um, over the holidays and Thanksgiving, it rolls into December, and people are just kind of relaxed. And you got you know bowl games and all kinds of fun stuff, and the holidays and vacations and time off, and then you just get back to the grind. You got to go back to work. You got to be in the schedule. Your schools are, uh, schools are back in. Kids got you know sports and school and homework, and you're trying to be more specific with your training. You're trying to you know be on more of a schedule, and sometimes it uh, it just flies by. So it's a good, it's a, it's a good thing in, in my opinion. Hopefully uh, everyone listening uh, took advantage of the first month of the year. Uh, if it's your first time tuning in, welcome. We appreciate you giving us your time. We know you have quite a lot of options in the triathlon, triathlon podcast universe and just podcasts in general. It's very valuable, so we appreciate you tuning in today. We cover it all. We do swim, bike, and run specific podcasts. We do race recaps and also a lot of our race previews. But for the most part, Mike and I as coaches, athletes, best friends, we just sit back, relax, have an open, honest discussion about what we're going through in life, not just as human beings, but also as coaches and athletes ourselves. Uh, Mike and I both work with a wide range of athletes all across the globe from beginning level triathletes looking at their very first 5K or sprint and triath triathlon all the way up through elite level amateurs trying to get back to the world championships and everyone in between from all over the world. And we'll use the feedback loop we have with them and training peaks, emails, text messages and the like to drive the discussion of the day. And we also uh, utilize our Facebook group. You can search that crushing iron group answer one simple question we'll let you right in great uh, great community awesome people fantastic resource uh, and a sport that can oftentimes be overcomplicated with way too much information out there to sift through uh, it is a safe place to ask questions and get honest constructive feedback uh, and from a lot of experienced people and we'll go in there at least once a month like we did last week and do a little bit of a q a take the pulse of the community answer as many questions as we can but that's it. We don't do sponsors. We don't do ads, but we do have one agenda, and that's to keep you happy and healthy in your endurance sports journey. And I do want to say um, that is our most important thing we do, but I want to thank everyone the past few weeks that has taken advantage of the way to support us, which is through our gear tab. Uh, go into our website, c26triathlon.com, click on the gear tab. Purchase some swag. Again, we don't do sponsors or ads. We try to keep this clean and crisp and uh, uninfluenced uh, by, you know, sponsored type people, companies, and corporations. So the best way to support us is to go there and click on the C26 store and find some swag you like, whether it's, uh, you know, a water bottle, a hoodie, a hat, maybe even some swim caps down the road. That is the best way to do it. It supports us. And uh, so I just want to thank everyone because we have seen uh, quite an uptick in that. So very much uh, something we very, very much appreciate uh, the support that uh, you guys give us because we love doing this and we plan on doing it for uh, for quite a while. And uh, outside of that, you can always go on iTunes or the uh, favorite podcast platform that you use and give us a solid uh, rating and review. 
Um, that's it. That's a great way to support us. Um, and we look forward to supporting you today by a scheduled podcast. Well, we promised this in the last year to do more of a focus on short course, kind of an intro to short course training and racing. We're going to do that today. But before we talk about short course uh, training and uh, some of the myths and also some of the uh, actual facts about uh, training for quote unquote short course, I'm going to toss it to you for a uh, news bulletin. News bulletin. <laughs> Before we get into the news bulletin, I just want to say that I just picked up and restocked on the lightweight hoodies, so uh, more are available if you go check that out. And also, we have for the first time printed C26 shirts with the word triathlon below them, and they are available as well on the website, and thanks for your support. All right, so as as promised, as you mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about short course today, and also as promised... We have, we're launching our development program, and that is already up on the website. It's around the front page. There's also a tab under coaching and then under a beginner's header. Um, you'll be able to check out, there's three tiers of this uh, development package. We have the standard, which is basically getting somebody from the couch to their first sprint. And we're trying to get people into the sport. I remember it well. You remember it well. when I Well, maybe you don't remember when I was just starting, but... I remember my first, uh, you know, foray into sprint triathlon, and I was like, there's no way, man. This is ridiculous. But we want to make that more accessible, and so we put together a basic standard package, which includes a, it includes a 20-week couch to sprint plan, but there's also a 16-week and a 12-week version. So if you're already kind of a little bit further along the line, you can start with 12 weeks or 16 weeks, whatever feels right to you. And I think we'll get into that today. We have to start where you're at instead of trying to rush the program, because I think a lot of people try and do that and then end up not liking things because it's so hard. <laughs> so uh, that also comes with like a, every one of these plans will have, uh, I'll put, I put a video at the beginning with me on camera talking about the particular week and explaining what, you know, the goals are and what you should be thinking about and how to do certain workouts and why they matter and all that kind of stuff. So it's like a five or six minute video at the beginning of each week that helps kind of help walk you through the week. That's the standard package, which is just the sprint. And then you can go to the premium package, which will be a sprint and an Olympic plan. It also comes with the video instructions. Uh, they both come with beginner guide to triathlon PDF. And I got to say, I looked at, look through that and it's not bad. It's like 40 pages of uh, everything you want to know about doing triathlon from gear to fueling to uh, race locations to building community and how to stay with it when it gets tough and all that kind of stuff. And then the premium package also has access to the C26 online hub, which is where we keep all our resources. Uh, all the athlete zoom calls are in there for over the last few years. And so are uh, instructional videos and all kinds of other stuff. And then the third one, which we're really pumped about is the team package, which includes everything mentioned beforehand but it also comes with a c26 mentors one of our athletes and we've had a lot of really awesome people volunteer to be mentors and help someone who's just getting in the sport get started and answer their questions along the way through email and i think that's going to be huge because when you start there's a million questions as we all know and somebody like a mentor who's been there and been doing this for a long time can really save you a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of frustration. So the team package comes with the mentor and also that team package, uh, you can buy uh, the race uh, C26 racing kits and things like that as well. So it's pretty cool. So there's three tiers, standard premium and team package. And if you know anybody maybe that's uh, looking to get into triathlon or looking to change their lifestyle a little bit, have send them our way, man. And, uh, they can look into these different options and they're all priced pretty affordable and we want to make it something that uh, people can do and we want to get more people involved. And there's, and I should mention that uh, we have put the C26 club out there again um, for a limited time. And basically that is if you sign up and you're doing an Ironman or a 70.3 or sprint or Olympic or whatever it is, or mount multiple races, you sign up, fill out some information and then we build your whole uh, race season out and with tapers and recovery and everything like that in and around all the races that you have in there. So that option is out there as well. And, uh, we're looking forward to it. Uh, we hope we can 
get some more people in the sport. And, and I'm sure you all have friends out there that have been kind of asking a lot of questions that might be interested. So please pass the word along. And, uh, if you have any questions about stuff, you can email me crushing iron at Gmail. Excellent. Yeah. I'm, I'm super excited about this. You did an awesome job putting these packages together again. They're all the packages and what they include with pricing are on, is on the front page, the website. Um, and we did, we priced them super affordable for a few reasons. One, you know, the, that's one of the barriers of entry to people getting in the sport is uh, they don't know where to start, right? You know, they're a triathlete magazine and people are doing, you know, reviews on $18,000 bikes and people are like, I don't, I don't know how to get in. So that's, this is kind of our way to either, you know, make the leap yourself and, and have some guidance with a mentor and, and good coaching and good and a good training plan. But also if you know somebody who's been, you know, asking you a ton of questions, because, you know, as soon as you get in the sport and you tell people, they're like, how do you do that? How do you train? Um, this is a great gift for them, you know, especially the standard package, you know, and working your way up. So it'd be a great gift, kind of a nudge to get someone out the door and before we even get rolling on <clears throat> just the topic for today, you know, reading through, we, we're doing a bunch of, uh, we're do, we do athlete intros uh, in our active athlete page in the Facebook group. And and I'm always reminded how people got into this sport and, and not just the things that they have accomplished, but the things that they've been able to change about themselves, the things they've been able to persevere through, how triathlon and endurance sports has helped them navigate some of the the biggest obstacles and, and challenges in their life. And so it's not really just a gift of, of getting in the sport. It, it, for a lot of people, it's a gift of kind of like helping them save an aspect of their life or make a specific and, and actionable change to put themselves first, to, you know, to be different um, and to, to be happier and healthier. And that really is, the, you know, the goal of the podcast and the goal of what we want to have, you know, within the sport, uh, especially this year, is just growing it and, and not just the benefits that, you know, racing and training has for you physically, but what it does for people mentally, emotionally, and most people on this podcast can obviously, if you do triathlons, you know, um, you know, you know how it is. So, um, again, check that out. Uh, but without further ado, you know, we, we get this question a lot and this is, it's actually one of my favorite topics, you know, short sh quote unquote, short course racing. So when I refer to short course racing, I'm talking, sprints and Olympics. And, and as a coach, you know, we, we work with athletes from, you know, sprint level all the way up through obviously Ironman level, um, athletes. And it's always interesting when you, cause I think there's this, um, there's this, uh, thought process that athletes have or kind of a, a myth that, that sprint training and Olympic training is just this really, really, really different beast than long course training and racing. Yes, there are some, there are a few similar, uh, a few differences, a few key differences, obviously, like you're not going to go for, you know, a six hour bike ride for training for a sprint or Olympic, but I think most athletes would be incredibly shocked if they, and again, we aren't elite level athletes, but I, I just for a quick example, you know, if you, if you want to go back and look at, you know, two of the best athletes right now racing on the men's side, you know, Gustav Eden and uh, Christian Blumenfeld, you know, their weekly volume changed very little from their strictly Olympic cycle through Ironman training. You know, you, you look at guys like Alistair Brownlee, who is arguably one of the best ITU Olympic distance athletes in the world. When he, it's, it's so funny when you when you listen to him talk about his training he used to do, you know, because, again, everyone hears sprint and Olympic distance. They think I don't need to train as much and you don't necessarily have to. Right. right. But I think people forget the, the benefit of training at a specific level and how specific you should be. And I was listening to him talk the other day on a, on a different podcast. And again, he was the he won the Olympic gold medal um, in 2012 in London. And I think he was averaging like 30 to 35 hours a week. And he did. He ran like eight to nine times, 10 times a week. Right. All of those easy except for one. Right. And then his long rides were about three to four hours for a guy that's only got a bike 26 miles and, and, uh, his, again, his runs, he would hit a long run of an hour and 40 where the run would might take him 35 minutes. Right. And, and I say this because the majority of his work was aerobic, right. And you, and you, and you go back and, or you look at, you know, um, elite training squads, um, in ITU right now, again, ITU is, is world triathlon. It is sprint and Olympic distance racing. If you look at the the training squads, you look at some of their training, you listen to them talk, they still spend a huge amount of time in zone two, LT1, moderate intensity, easy riding, easy running, because th that is the way to get better. And and so I, I just wanted to cover that real quick because I think, again, 
when people say, ah, oh, well, you know, I just I, I haven't done enough speed work, right? That's everyone's everyone's excuse when they're not fast enough. When when the um, the fact is, is you probably haven't just done enough work in general. And and what happens in one of the most dangerous things I think when you get into the sport, sprint and Olympic, is you think, well, I need to race fast. And so in order to race fast, I've got to run fast, right? I've got to bike fast. So people hop in, they immediately swim threshold the entire time. They bike threshold the entire time. They run threshold the entire time, right? You're trying to put, and we, we always talk about building a base, like in a massive, huge aerobic base or an aerobic cake, right? Where intensity is the icing, right? And what happens a lot of times is when athletes get into the sport, sprint or Olympic distance, you're trying to do your first one, you see that it's shorter, right? Or an athlete that is, um, that's going from 70.3 or full distance race. And they took some time off. They're like, I got to go back to speed. And that's all they do. Right. And what happened is, is you're actually trying to put icing on a cake that doesn't exist, right? You're trying to basically take the spatula out, you know, and, and get some icing on and then basically try to paste it on a few crumbs because that's how low your aerobic base is, especially when you're just getting into the sport, right? You're just coming in. You have no aerobic base. Aerobic training should be the majority of what you do. Now, there are some, some you know, short specifics that we'll go into here in a little bit, but that was that's just something I really want to start off with with those, especially that, that don't have guidance, that don't have a coach, aren't working off a plan. In order to be your best, you have to have an aerobic base. And that starts with aerobic training, aerobic meaning with oxygen. And just because you're doing sprint and Olympic distance training doesn't mean all your sessions have to be hard. Because, again, you find yourself in that gray zone 24-7, which is zone three, or you're just doing what people call, you know, race pace all the time. You know, we talk in, in we talk a lot about, you know, you want your pace to feel easy. That goes that's the same from sprint all the way up through full distance, no matter what it is. But the the best way, the safest way, the most productive way for your overall development is to get most of that done through aerobic work. And so I, I wanted to start off with that, you know, before we even talk about how you should move and, and some certain some specifics when it talk when you talk about the intervals and the the icing that you are trying to put on. That's just something that I think cannot be overstated enough is how important and crucial aerobic training is and the volume that you that you can do, right? If you're if you're time constrained, that's fine. You won't do as much. But if you have the time don't think that extra 30, an extra 30 minutes, you know, isn't going to do huge benefits because it is. And so I wanted to touch on that before we got, we got rolling. Cause I think again, most people get burnt out because they, they hop in, they try to go too fast, too quick, too soon, because they think things are so short and they end up getting hurt or they end up not developing at all. They're just kind of starting with one race pace and trying to keep that throughout their training and then hop into a sprint Olympic and then find themselves dusted by the, by the time they hit the finish line feel pretty strong about that, I think. I feel very strongly about that. <laughs> no, but it's so true. It's uh, And that's really one of the things I kept in mind while we were going through these plans was, you know, because you, one of the things is, uh, you know, you're going to get people from all different walks of life, hopefully coming in here. And you have to keep that in mind. And everything is all relative. And it's so tempting, especially if, you know, you maybe used to be an athlete or something like that growing up and you haven't done anything for 20 years to be like, well, I used to be able to do this. I need to go get it. And I need to prove right now in week one that I can race in, you know, week 16 or 20 or 12 or whatever. And you get so far ahead of yourself, but you're right. I mean, like the lessons learned um, have been many through me by trial and error and mistakes and things like that. And one of the, the best ones is that, you just race better when your um, body is stronger and you're more capable of holding more zone two stuff and over time. And then, you know, it's like one of those things where you you just build up to the point where you're strong enough to hold it. And then I always talk about instead of trying to trying to go fast all the time, it's just like your body can release itself easier. And it's like it, you can trust your body to kind of like just increase the pace. And it's always, you know, we come from, at least I did when I started the sport and I even started running, I still come from the playground as a kid. And it's sort of like you just take off and start running. And that's just not the philosophy um, for, you know, triathlon. It's always, I was talking about easing into every workout and things like that and letting it unfold. And I think that's sort of exactly what you're saying is that, 
you have to train within your capabilities and own that and master it before you go on too hard. Now, before I forget about it, I want it because you were talking about community and, and things like that. And I just want to talk real quick about, um, I was listening to this discussion about, they were talking about that book. That, I think you read it too, right? Tribe with Sebastian Younger. I think mm-hmm. his name was. Yep. And I mean, like I've really, it's really been heavy on my mind lately. And, and, and that's, I think, you know, getting people involved and getting people to kind of, as you get older, you know, I saw a meme the other day that says one of the worst decisions I ever made was becoming an adult. <laughs> and, and I think there's, I just think there's so much funny. It's funny because like we want to have that community. I think just over the last few years, it's been difficult to build community and build, you know, have good friendships and things like that. And this is another big part of what we're doing. And I mean, that book in tribe, that guy's like talking about how the best part of his life when, when it was when he was at war or like in combat, you know, it's like, think about how powerful that is just cause they had, you know, he had people around him, like-minded people and they were on the same missions and things like that. So I think that's a part that, um, you know, we always push camps community and, and put community really at the top a lot. Our, our people make this whole thing click. And, um, so it's just a step in that right direction for people to kind of maybe find something that resonates with them. So, uh, zone two, of course. And I just want to let you know, I mean, you would not be doing 30 hours a week by any means. Uh, with these <laughs> no, no, I just, the, the point of that, and yeah, no one's doing 30, 35 hours a week, but the, the point is, is that, what I'm trying to make, and obviously it's proportionate of the hours that you can handle is that the best athletes in the world that could train at high intensities all the time don't. Mm -hmm. And so we are no different, right? And they have giant aerobic bases. So these athletes that are the best in the world that are doing sprinting Olympic distances, they're still choosing, right? With these gigantic cakes, they're still choosing to continue to make it as big as possible, right? And it's all relative, right? So when you get into the sport, again, the best thing you can do, or if you're shifting back, right? So I want to make sure this is, this is a podcast for anybody who's doing a sprint Olympic, regardless of, of where you come from. It's your, it's your first endeavor, or you're coming back from some time off, or you just don't feel like you know how to train for them is the, the best, most efficient way is to be efficient. Right. And that comes with consistency and that comes with aerobic conditioning. And you will get, again, if you want to accumulate more, right. And I mean, I don't mean accumulate more by always adding on extra and extra and extra. I mean, accumulating more by increasing your ability to be available, right? Availability breeds consistency. Consistency breeds progress. And, and again, if you it, one of the one of the best quotes you hear from all of the the best run coaches in the world is, if you hate running, you're probably running too fast, and it's just one hundred percent true. Like how absolutely hard people think they have to run, right? They they either sprint or they walk, right? It's like putting an athlete in the pool for the first time. They don't have multiple speeds, right? Multiple gears. The best thing you can do, right, is to not overdo it, to work. And especially when you're starting off, because, because when you start training and exercising, what you can start to see gigantic benefits just because you're doing more than you have in the past. It's very, the first, I would say four to six weeks for any athlete taking on a new training program is so much like starting out a new diet, the diet might not even be or, or, or restricting food or counting calories or, or watching what you eat or stop drinking or laying off in the sweets, whatever it is, you'll see the biggest bump in the first four to six weeks. Maybe not even because the the regime you're on is perfect for you, but because you're going, you're starting to watch what you take in. Maybe you're limiting sugar. Maybe you're not, in, you know, having a whole piece of pizza, you know, a whole giant large pizza on Saturday night. You're not doing anything magical, but just by not doing anything stupid, you're going to make gains. And that is also so very true with getting into the sport or doing sprints and Olympics is that the best way to get better is by being able to do it every single day. Because if you go from sedentary, you go from, and again, athletes have, we have a very, very short memory of the things we don't want to, we don't want to remember, right? we, We lack objectivity in so many areas. You know, you're doing a questionnaire for an athlete. Yeah, my, my, my running is my strength. You know, back in high school, I was an 800 meter guy. That's mm-hmm. that's my thing. 
And you know, I'm like looking at, you know, DOB. I'm like born, you know, September 23rd, 1947. And you're like, all right, buddy, you, you may have been a runner back then, but things have changed a little bit. You know, in triathlon, it's the same thing. Yeah, I've not done a lot of Ironman before. I've done a lot of 7.3s, you know. I got a six on them, but I'm gonna go fast this year. So I'm like, yeah, but you haven't been consistent in your training. You you've been detraining for an extended period of time. So we still need to start from not from yeah, kind of from scratch, right? Take you where you are, and and that is, I can't impress upon you enough of how important it is to increase your availability of training by doing it the right way, and, and that means you know, 75 to maybe even 95% of your training being easy, being aerobic, because that's, that's the developmental place you need to start. Because again, if you, if you're trying to put on icing on a cake that doesn't exist, you're going to get nowhere. And so when you're thinking about making your own plan or you're looking at plans or you're thinking, I, I, you know, a lot of people are are intimidated by sprints alone because I got to go so fast. Well, fast is relative, you know, and I can say this from a guy who doesn't race sprints and Olympic much as you know, Olympics much. And I think I've told us before, like, you know, I think it was three or four years ago, I was in some of the best 70.3 shape of my life. And I did this Olympic distance. And I remember I covered up my bike computer and I told myself, all right, I am not going to look at it, but I'm going to go all out. I'm just going to go for it. And I got done with the race, had a, had a good race and look back on it. Did I go all out? No. Did I go 90%? No. Did I hit 70.3 power? Yes. <laughs> because that's all I knew, right? And so I think people have are scared because they, they we we have a sense of what's hard and what's fast and what's intense based on the level and the type and the distance of training that we do. So when you go sprint in Olympia, people think, you know, balls out, you know, I'm going to go full speed, hundred percent the entire time. That's also not the case, right? You have to stick with the ability that you have. And so, and that comes with one aerobic base and two, it comes with how efficient you can be, how you can move, right? You go into a gym for the first time, you start a strength training program, any great strength training program or any great gym or, or, you know, boot camp or CrossFit or functional training place you start out, if they are worth their weight and their grain of salt, they will start you out with nothing, right? PVC pipes. They don't hand you a barbell with 45s on each side. They hand you a PVC pipe. Why? Because movement matters, right? You can try to strain, right? And, and, you know, do a, do a clean and jerk or a deadlift or a back squat with just horrendous form and high weight. And you, you will get nowhere except for getting hurt, right? You'll hit the shelf. What they want you to do, hopefully, is to move correctly because movement, one, keeps you healthy, right? Keeps you coming back and allows you to lift more weight more often. And that is the same thing with swimming and riding and running. Building your aerobic base, and especially in the beginning, make sure you're moving correctly. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. Getting athletes who have absolutely no experience with swimming is my favorite. Because all we're doing is building habits. We're not breaking down habits and rebuilding them, right? It's so much easier to build a habit from scratch than it is to break bad habits to build good ones. And so start off with, with knowing the right things, taking time to be efficient. Because if you're, you can try really, really hard to go nowhere, or you can spend a little bit of extra time in your development to do it right, and then you'll reap the benefits moving forward. So know how to, how to do the stroke the way you need to do, right? And then spend time on it. Because wh- one of the biggest issues you see with athletes that try to speed through triathlon or speed through their progression is they lack the skill and efficiency to move correctly. And then they just keep that forever. And then when you ask them to move correctly, they just can't. Because it, 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 they've been doing it for 10 or 15 years. Don't skip the step aerobic conditioning, right? Working your aerobic system, building your cake. Even if you feel like you have no layer, you know how much faster you're going to be just by having like a, a tiny, tiny base layer significantly faster than trying to put icing on nothing. And two, focus on the movement, right? Pedal stroke, high RPM, low RPM runs, strides, you know, butt kicks, all these things to focus on your economy, walk in between, and, and this goes for every athlete all the way up through because I think once you've done an Ironman, everyone thinks that they can, they know everything because they were able to do the distance. Well, we don't. There's always things that are evolving. We are evolving as a, as a, as a person. 
And so when you're getting in the sport, you're coming back down to sprints and Olympics. You don't know it all because you did a fall. You don't know it all because it's 70.3, right? Just like you don't know how to go long just because you've done a sprint or an Olympic and you just got to take fast to far. You need to, well, again, aerobic conditioning and movement matters. And I, I can't impress upon you that enough how important it is to move correctly, especially starting out when your frame is probably a little bit weaker, right? Your run form, you know, is, is lacking. You might not know how to ride a bike very well at all, right? You're probably learning how to do clip-ins, right? Um, and, and your swim form is just basically I'm trying to move my arms in a way to not drown on the way to the other end. Movement matters. So focus on that and don't shortcut it. Hopefully you're in the sport to continue on doing it. So inch your way forward, right? Like we said a couple podcasts ago, an inch is a cinch, right? But most of the time what you see is we try to rush our way through everything because that's where that's kind of how we, we are in life right now. We don't rush. We want things right now. We want Amazon same day. You don't. You want to be progressive and you want to be intelligent about it. Yeah, that uh, being available to train, that that always resonates with me. That's like the best way to get better is to be available. And when you come in, I think the thing is, is like, you know, a lot of people, including me, will, if they haven't been training for a while or haven't been doing shit. And then when I started, I kind of felt like this, but I had to really rein it in. I, I started my whole endurance journey with a couch to 5K and I, 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 I'm always rogue. I always go rogue. And, but I committed to sticking with the program on this. Like, you know, we would do some of these walk, run, walk, run, you know, whatever's. And at the end it might be 20 minutes or something like that. And my buddy Jim was with me and I'd be like, I feel pretty good. Why don't we run a little more? And I said, no, I'm not. I like, I followed it to the letter and it's exactly the reason is because of what you're talking about is that I wanted to just see if I could do it right. And if that would actually keep me in it, because I had tried to run many, many times before and you always, you know, you get a little warmed up and then you think you can be the old guy again. And then, you know, you can be the old guy for about a minute and then your hamstring blows or whatever the case is, you know, it's like you have to, go slow. And I still think about that last, yeah, the last two years, all I've done is Ironman and I've been going slow and building that up. And, and I have to remind myself that I'm, I'm not in the shape or I haven't, uh, really progressed in a way that, that, that can get me going to that speed factor. So I'm really taking that easy right now and I'm building and I'm building and I'm just trying to do it the right way because you know, that, that, that's what I was thinking about the whole time when I was looking at, uh, this couch to sprint is like, I got to remember, you know, a lot of people that that's one of the things we want to impress on people is just to take it uh, slow and work on, like you said, your skills and your base and things like that. And, you know, it's really, especially with the run, if somebody's just starting to run, that's a tricky thing. And, you, you know, there's a lot of run walk. It's a build up. It's a slow build. You know, it's like 15 minutes easy on the bike just to get, you know, I don't care if it's a recumbent bike, you got to keep you know, you, you just got to, you know, get your legs spinning again and get used to that. And like in the water, you know, just do 25, take the breaks you need, just get in a rhythm and hopefully start, like you said, with the right form and be thinking about form and the, and the movement and the process, because that stuff, when you do it the right way and you, you're efficient about it. And we talked, I think last time about the, some of the great runners, they're just so efficient. And even the cyclists, and, and I know we do a lot of, uh, been doing a lot more kind of high cadence stuff, and people hate that, but it's just getting your legs in a position to move the right way and do it in, you know, just controlling it. There's nothing better than that because you can, I don't, when you're out sometimes in a race, you're like, damn, I just feel this really good balance right now. And I think that's a good indicator that your training was going well because. If you feel like you're off balance or you're struggling and one side's working harder than the other and all that, that just slows you down so much. And it's a, it's a thing of beauty to watch people with great form, whether it's in the pool or on the bike or on the run, because they just make it look so effortless. And that's the thing. I remember when I started, I was like, you know, how many people, I, uh, I could probably do the bike, but I can't, there's no way I could swim that far. And, and people don't understand how to be, like you said, to adjust speed and zones in, in the water, for example, it just seems so impossible, but you have to, it's all we talked about last time was relaxation and, and being able to relax and just move in a fluid manner with your limbs 
through the water or it's on a run or whatever. That's just so important. And that's what the, you know, we kept in mind, I think with the, these plans is just to build it up in the right way. And then all of a sudden it kind of crescendos and comes together for you. And then things start feeling easier and you never want to go too hard. And I love what you said about the reason why people hate running is because they're running too fast. That is so true. And I know that to this day, if I'm trying to train above my means or abilities, current fitness, whatever, I just, I just start hating it. So I, I've really been, you know, zoning in on this idea of just pulling back and just finding a groove and just let, let that kind of work for you and build up in the right way. Um, last night I got on the bike and I just, I didn't feel like hammering it and I just kind of cruised it along. And by the end I was like, man, that felt good, you know, and it had to be good for me. It was, a, you know, zone one, zone two thing, real easy, but that's where I'm at. And I think most people are there mo- most of the time, you know, I mean, when the weather changes, kind of things open up, you're outside more, you're just feeling a little better, your bo- your bones and muscles feel better. You can kind of start uh, getting after it a little more when you're ready for it. Don't fight it, let it flow. And <clears throat> that, that goes for every distance, but especially when you're just getting into the sport is, is most people try so hard. They're fighting to go fast or they're, they're fighting to go harder. They're fighting to create their intensity because it's, it's a fight in general, right? To either, to either get back into a groove or to start off and, but you want it to flow. Everything should flow. And, and again, one of the most important pieces is knowing your body understanding your body, what feels too hard, what doesn't feel good at all. Right. And so when you, when you go out there and you go from zero to fast, all you feel is out of breath and out of shape. You don't, you're not going to even create levels. You're just going to keep the main, your, your main, your main speed and then go fast for a bit, then walk for a while. And one of the best things you can do is establish a steady progressive routine that allows you a great opportunity each day to wake up and understand where am I? What am I feeling? What have I done the last few days? This is why I feel this. Let me see how I feel today. But what happens is most people, you know, they'll start the week off, you know, take their Monday off because that's what you do. And then they'll hit up track Tuesday, be destroyed for two or three days, and then not get back out there till Saturday or Sunday and be a weekend warrior. They feel somewhat fresh. So they go too hard. And so they, they yo you, they go up, they go down, they go up, they go down. There's no consistency. I, I use this example with, with an athlete or two, two athletes kind of, but two different stories that I'll blend into one is one athlete. I just say, you know, listen, you have to look at the whole block, right? Or the whole month, four weeks as one giant accumulation or ball or block of stress, not, not to focus on a specific day or what might happen in the future, but how can I handle the block, not just today. Another athlete just started working with who was doing, you know, lax days go swimming, zero cycling, but running no, and no, no strength work. And, and the runs weren't super uh, specific. So when we started off, I added in some, some, you know, more focused swimming, three rides from, from zero, right. With a little bit of an intensity, but the rest easy. And then focus running. And she was like, well, you know, I really, I'm scared I'm going to lose, you know, fitness or whatever, you know, my run. I said, I said, I, I understand that. But what you've been doing, right, is if you look at your month and you, you want to accumulate, you know, um, let's say you want to accumulate 36 points over the course of a month, right? 36 stress points. Well, what you've been doing is you've been creating, you know, three points, one, three points here, three points here, three points here for nine points for the week, right? So just three sessions, right? Same thing, doing it again next week, that's 18, you know, next week, 27, then you get 36. That's how you've been accumulating stress. High three, high three, high three, boom, 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 boom. What we want to do is see if we can get to 11 or 12 stress points per week by doing maybe a one here, a two here, a three here, a four here, a back to a one again, and then a two, right? So you're doing more consecutive days, but the numbers add up to around the same or even a little bit higher, the stress should feel the same because it's spread out evenly. And you go back and look over the course of the month, and instead of 36 stress points, you're up to mid 40s, maybe even close to 50, because you've utilized the seven days of the week, not just three or four. And that's a great way to do things. One, because it's progressive, right? 
because progressive and productivity are the two main things you're looking for, right? And being in a consistent process. Again, going back to the availability, going back to consistency. Because you're, 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 what, what happens when you go from no momentum cr- to creating momentum, right? That snowball effect. Once you get it rolling, you will start to see so many unbelievable gains in a short period of time because you're just getting moving again. Right. Kind of going back to what I talked about, you know, you, you start di- quote unquote dieting and your first week you lose four pounds. Did you lose four, did you lose four pounds of body fat? No, you lost probably two and a half of water weight and maybe a little bit less, but oh, this is it. I'm, you know, I'm kicking. Here we go. And then as you keep going, it gets harder, right? Just like it goes from you, you do your first 70.3, you know, and you're, you do a, a seven hour, you got plenty of wiggle room down to like, you know, the five hour, right? You can drop 30 minutes at a time, but then once you get faster and faster, now you're still going to drop a few minutes versus 30 minutes, right? Or an hour, you know, it's, it's like going, uh, it's like trying to PR a marathon versus trying to PR your hundred yard dash, right? The, the metrics and, and the improvement you're looking for are going to look a little bit different. And that's again, productivity and progression, right? And doing that in a safe, consistent way over time, right? Spreading out the sp- the stress, not as a weekend warrior, not as a three day weaker, but just one, creating a habit, right? This is what I do. This is who I am. This is what I'm going to make time for, right? For a variety of reasons. One, it's going to make me fitter. I'm going to get to the, I'm going to get to the sprint distance or Olympic distance. I'm going to feel confident and it's going to be healthier and be happier. I'm going to be less depressed and be less anxious. All these, the, the billion benefits that endurance sports and exercising and being outside can do for you, right? It's free. It's literally free. Right. But most people will choose, you know, to not do anything or choose food or alcohol or pharmaceuticals over the freeness that is the sunshine and movement and exercise. And that is what the sport can provide you. And so why wouldn't you want to do it every day? Right. Most athletes that we work with, once they get into the to, you know, a routine of doing things daily, despise day, days off. They hate them for the most part because they feel they, because they feel better when you train. And he, one of the very first things you mentioned, I think one of our very first podcasts we ever did was training and exercising should give you energy. And so the days you don't do it, you, you kind of fall back and you have less. If you're doing it the right way, if you're not doing it the right way and you need a break and you need a day off, it's because you went too hard. Right. You either went too hard or you did a really shitty job recovering. Right. You only slept three hours, but you got up anyway. You had terrible food. You know, all the stress was super high, but you you, you took things higher anyway. You didn't listen to your body. Listening and understanding and knowing your body is such, again, is another important, important piece. Right. You got building your aerobic base. You got movement matters. And then you got understanding and knowing your body. Because the other thing about knowing your body is it's going to be changing so rapidly that you, you, you'd have to know it. it's going to be a different person, like almost every four weeks. And you're going to start to see gains by consistency, not because, you know, your legs are fresh every time you run. Why? Cause you run every four days. <laughs> so they're going to be fresh, right? It's, you got to build that pattern. You got to build that consistency. Again, that's the best way to manage stress, spread it out equally over time. And then, you know, manipulate your intensities here and there. We'll talk about the intensity and the intensity distribution and the different types of intensity that lend itself to better sprint and Olympic distance racing, especially if you're coming from a background where you've done fulls, you've done same point threes, and you're that person that's like, yeah, I'm just doing sprints and Olympics, you know, uh, this year. Whenever you say that, remember the best athletes on this planet the fastest athletes on this planet are the ones that race the Olympic distance and sprint distance. They are the fittest and the fastest athletes on the planet. So whenever you say that, remember, I'm just I'm just saying this because it, it feels less to me or because I think bulls are the greatest. They're not. <laughs> That's just what you chose to do. Sprint and Olympic distance has has their own bag of tricks, has their own obstacles, has their own challenges that are just as, if not harder than 70.3s and full. So always remember that if, if again, if you're shifting from going from, from long to short, we're just trying to get better at short course, or you're coming into the sport to do short course, everything has its challenges and don't ever demean or belittle your progression or your choices or what matters most to you or your focus, because it's not a full, right? If you swim, if you bike, if you run, you're a triathlete, bar none, period. 
That's all that matters. Not that if you did an Ironman, not that if you did Kona, not that if you did a 70.3, not that if you did an Ironman branded event, not all those things. If you swim and you bike and you run, you're a triathlete. So don't think you need to do more and go longer to be considered one. That, that's, a, that's a personal thing, right? So again, I, again, I, I know it's kind of a side note, but it's one of those things that I, I, I always hear and, and kind of makes me cringe a little bit when I'm like, oh, that's, that's just not true. <laughs> You know, go, go again, go, go watch the, the, the Olympics and watch them race and tell me that they say, yeah, I'm only doing Olympics this year. It just happens to be the Olympics that, I, <laughs> that I'm doing this year, but that's all I'm doing this year. Just Olympics. Yeah. Well, confidence, faith and patience, all that kind of stuff plays into this. And it's, it's, it is so easy to get kind of off track and think about doing things that you think I right too fast and I pacing is racing and pacing is training and everything like that. And I've been really, you know, in and out, it, we've been doing this for a long time. And, um, even now I'm thinking about things like what you're talking about a little bit more, you know, how things just sort of sink in, but then they don't sink in. And then you got to kind of revisit them and you're like, wait a minute, I, I knew this all along. And now, now you're paying more attention to it. I do think that that's a great thing. I uh, even with my running lately, I've been doing. I've been thinking about because I'll take walk breaks on the treadmill or whatever. But I've been thinking about even walking progressions, which is really interesting to me. Where I'll start off with you know sort of a slower pace, and then as I build, I'll get I'll break it down back to walk because. I mean, because th- I, you know, a lot of tra- people train for Ironman and, you know, reality sinks in and a lot of people are actually walking a lot during the Ironman marathon. And I keep thinking about that. I was like, well, if I'm going to walk a little bit, I might as well be a better walker too. So I've been sort of building <clears throat> my walking economy as well. Um, and I love the the whole thing about training for an Olympic and how those are the best athletes on the planet we talk about. I like the, I always like thinking about like, if you're really in a great Olympic space, you're probably in a really good pretty good 70.3 space and 70.3 all the way up to a full. It's all the same kind of like just mastering that level below it kind of puts you in the ballpark for the next level. Right. So if you can get into a, a good groove and find your way up to a, be a, you know, a solid sprint racer, you're probably right on the cusp of being a, a good Olympic racer too, but it's all progress. It's all progression and it's all doing it the right way and making sure your body's in a, in a space that to handle it. Um, I, I just, it's just like, I love the whole thing about the beginner aspect of it too. And because we can, I like what you said too, about if you think if you've done an Ironman, you think you know everything about triathlon, because that's, a, it's kind of true. You know, it's like, I've mastered the pinnacle, but you haven't mastered anything. I mean, we all are beginners almost every day. If you think about it, there's always something to learn. I mean, shit, I was watching uh, videos on canning last night and I'm really into that and I'm just starting. And, uh, but it's like, I think there's so much to, to learn every day. If you, it's almost like the beginner mentality is something to keep in your head. You know, it's like you, you might've had a great day yesterday and think you mastered everything. And then the, and you wake up today and everything kind of hits you right in the face again. So it's like going in with a fresh perspective on, on every day of training and trying to learn something, I think, and not only learn something about, you know, the sport in general, but learn something about yourself and how you react to certain different things. And when you're training, how do you kind of get better at doing little things that, you know, no one would ever notice, but whether it's your, you know, stride length or turnover or your balance and, you know, just the little things I I'm always working on, even like, I'm throwing an elliptical right now just to kind of warm up and before I get on a treadmill or something like that. And I'm really, while I'm doing the elliptical, I'm not watching news or doing any kind of thing like that. I'm really thinking about my balance and, you know, doing it with no hands every once in a while and and really just trying to feel balanced because for me, the balance, not only side to side, but front to back is one of the most important things about this sport in every part of it. And, you know, you swimming, think about like how your body can get out of, you know, you want it to be on that right plane and, and cycling and how you, are you leaning too far out? Are you too far back? Whatever it may be. If you find that sweet spot and I'm always looking for it, always looking for it, no matter what I'm doing, whether it's the walking on the treadmill or running on the hills, 
just trying to find what you always say, what you talk about the economy. How do you find a, a better way, an easier way to do this? It shouldn't always be hard. I mean, we should be looking for easier ways to do it and not like shortcuts, but just better form and, and better approaches to everything we do because like we are talking about, man, it's like some days you run and you're like, damn, there it is. I don't know what that is though. And then you lose it. And the swim is the, is a great one for that, right? You get done swimming and by the end of the swim, you think you got it. And the next two days later you go in the pool and you're like, what the hell was I doing? I just think it's really important to, to think about that and really crystallize it in your brain. And once you get those things kind of locked in, you can really go further and do it easier because you got that good form. You got that good balance. Keeping the fun, right? And, and embracing how fun it is to learn about the sport and to learn about yourself. And, and I think, again, I'll just be honest. We're going to make this a part two because I have so much more to say. So we'll do, we're going to do a short course intro part two later this week. And I'll do how to not stick at swimming uh, for next week. But um, there's just so much to cover. And but you said something that that has about keeping things fun and learning and, and not getting so caught up in the weeds. of it. I mean, I comment on an athlete who's super accomplished, done fulls, tr- do training for Boston and always questions things after every workout. And I just, I said that I said, listen, I said, I said, the amount of questions you ask about yourself each day, add stress and lessens the experience that you had. Two questions. One, did I do my best? Yes. Number two, did I have fun doing it? Yes. End of story. Let coach take care of the rest because the extra analyzing you choose to do removes the fun, right? Or create stress. And you say, well, I love the data. There's a huge difference in loving data and knowing how to use it. Most people just love metrics and numbers. They have, they don't know how to use it. They don't know how to, to create progressions and look to see if they've actually gotten better or gotten fitter. They just like numbers because they like numbers. Keep the fun. And that's been as a, as a, as a coach who, the longer you coach full time, in my experience, and I know most experience for our, for coaches, the more you coach full time, the harder it is to train yourself. Not because you can't, but because you have a hard time, you know, balancing between, you know, being a dream maker and a dream chaser. And and one of the things I've been trying to do is remember how fun it was to start the sport. And how great it was to just kind of get myself back into a groove of, you know, taking time for myself and I still got goals, but it is, it, it's challenging. Right. And then, and I think saying maybe a dream maker is a, maybe a little bit overstated and dramatic, but you get the point. Cause that, that's your job is to put energy towards get, uh, how, you know, allowing and increasing the chances for the people's dreams to come true. And, and that takes energy and effort. And you kind of put your, that energy and effort away from making your own dreams come true. And that's, I've talked a lot about, you know, Hayden lately and how much he's just obsessed with hockey. And I love it because I, I, I've always wanted him to just love a sport because I just think it's, I think every kid should love a sport or love something, right. That's not that that's extracurricular like that. That's that causes movement. And, and every day, I mean, he'll watch NHL reruns before school. He'll watch NHL reruns after school. We're watching road to the Stanley cup 2020 as a documentary. (laughs) Like he's, He's all in. Every day he gets home from school, he wants to go outside. He wants to play extra. And, and yesterday or Sunday, I just asked him, you know, I was like, he's like, you, you don't, go down the stairs of the basement. And, and you know, it was during the um, the Eagles 49ers game that really wasn't, wasn't much of a game at all. He's like, can, can you shoot pucks at me? I want, I want to practice blocking because he wants to, like, try out playing goalie. And I was like, I really, I really just want to kind of sit and relax. I just, I just, want, to, just want to sit. It's a Sunday, right? I work all the time. I just want to relax and watch football. It's like, okay, well, can you just sit in the couch and throw pucks at me? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, yeah, dude, I can get behind that. Sure. So he gets his, he gets his like fake goalie mask on and I bring out his like little mini goal from outside and put it in the corner and he gets his like equipment on. I just like chucking pucks at him and he's just loving it. And I asked him, I said, dude, I said, I said, why, why do you want, to do this so much do you want is it because you want to get better right is it because you just like it is like the challenge and he just goes you know i don't know it's just fun Mm. and i just it hit me and i was like this just it's 
it's so simple, right? That the the be- and then the best athletes in the world they don't see their training as a chore; they see it as fun. They just love it. And if you want to love something, it has to be fun. And I can't, again, I can't say that enough about getting into the sport or even how long, how long you've been there is you've got to make it fun. There's way too many opportunities to, uh, you know, for, to be tripped up these days to present challenges or to offer your own challenges up by looking at Strava or social media or reading, you know, reading this or reading that. It was like, your journey is yours. And especially if you're starting out, that's the best way to do it, you know, it's to not, and again, I, I feel incredibly fortunate because knowing my, knowing my addictive tendencies and, and other things that I, that I off, oftentimes will struggle with. I'm so, I feel very, very fortunate that I got into the game of triathlon at such a, or at such an early time before all the gadgets and the Strava and the, in the, you know, comparison, it was just, yeah, you just, you went off a sheet of paper, right? There was no data recorded. You just use a pencil and a piece of paper, right? Or a spreadsheet if you were lucky, or you print it off a training plan off, you know, off, you know, uh, the website and you print it out, you know, upstairs and you put it on the fridge and you cross days off. There was no, you know, or you went back and you got in your car, right? I did that a ton. I get got in my car and drove the route that I just, ran <laughs> just because I, w- I wanted to know how far I ran that because I didn't know. And, but it made me, it, it, I fell in love with the sport then. And obviously, you know, it's kind of hung on a little bit since then, you know, 20 plus years, but getting into the sport or getting back into the sport, they both present challenges. They both present a billion opportunities to compare yourself, to see how not fast you are, to see how slow you are, to see how, you know, you don't have the best bike or do I need the best wheels? No, what you need to do is have fun. Yeah. Minimal gear, minimal, minimal gear, whatever. The only gear you need to start is the gear they require you to have in the, um, on the race website, right? That's it. You don't need any extra because all it does is take away from the experience, right? It's, it's kind of like, you know, the, a freshman coming in or the rookie team coming in that wins it all. After that, it's like everything else is a failure because they, they started off. They don't, you don't know how hard you had to work to get to where you got. Don't start off with race wheels and power meters and, and helmets and fancy gear, bare minimum, bare minimum and keep it fun and keep it light. And because the more you get caught up in the extracurriculars, because triathlon is the sport with the most extracurriculars in terms of gear and things that you feel like you have to have to be successful. You don't, you just don't again, going back to my, the, the podcast I was listening to about how Sir Brownlee asking about his training is, yeah, I, I didn't keep a log. <laughs> yeah. Didn't keep a log. I have no idea how far I ran or what I was doing or what the Watts I was pushing. Didn't keep a log. And, and here he is, you know, still, you know, it's still one of the best athletes on the planet when he's healthy. And so, I, again, it's whether you're getting back into the sport and you're starting small or where you get in the sport in general and you're doing the right thing by starting small. Keep it fun. Keep it light. Surround yourself with people who want to also keep it fun and keep it light. Don't partner up with someone who wants to, you know, stop, you know, stop watch everything you do compare everything you do because it's not fun. You just want, you just want to be able to do it because the more fun you have the more, again, going back to the second kind of piece we talked about the, um, the, the more you do it, the more fun you're going to have, the more fun you're going to have, the more you're going to do it. And the more you do it, the better you're going to get. And the better you get, the more fun you have. It's a, it's a, it's not a vicious cycle, you know, in a negative term, it's a productive cycle. So again, think about the cycle that you're in the cycle that you want to create if you haven't placed fun in there, then it's not the right cycle because fun is how things, how the magic happens. Cause you'll want to keep doing, and you'll get into the sport and you'll start to love it. And the other stuff just won't mean as much, right? You won't mean, it won't mean nearly as much and it won't be something you hang your hat on or you have success or failures after every run, especially when you're starting out, just getting out the door is the win. Just making it an extra block is the win, you know? You know, that again, I just I, I loved those days. How how awesome it was to see simple gains like, you know, I I made it, you know, two extra mailboxes down the street before I turned around and how much better that felt. Right. I lasted five more minutes on the bike than I did before. 
right? I swam 100 more yards than before. Those are gigantic, gigantic wins. And so just make sure you're, sure you're keeping it fun. Again, like I, as always, we, we say that we, uh, we'll do things and well, we, we do, we just do it on our own time, but uh, I have so much more to say about short course and Olympic distance, uh, racing. I'll talk about intensity distribution, the different types of intensity you should do when you should do them, the differences, the, the big differences and what you should focus on VO two max and, and all these different things that'll make you a better athlete for short course and how that differs greatly, uh, in some ways, but it's also very similar to long course racing. I'll do that, uh, later this week and then do how to not, and how to not suck at swimming the next week. But, um, there's just too much to say. And, and again, I, I don't want to short, I don't want to shorthand it, uh, and, and rush through it. So I'll, I'll do that later this week. Um, but we hope this was at least a good start. Yeah. I haven't, <clears throat> I haven't told you this, but my mantra for the year has been, uh, get serious about having fun. And, yeah. You told me, I love it. Oh, I did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, uh, and it really is, it's, uh, I love what you said about going the extra mailbox, because I remember that, like, vague, you know, just clear as a bell. Like, little wins like that, and how much fun it was to kind of do something, you know, new every day, and I think a lot of us get in this, and we're so, like, you get on a a treadmill, and you're like, man, I'm going to. I want to see if I could go two hours today. I mean, cause you can, right. You get at a certain point when you can do things like that, but really I've been having more fun by how much can I shorten this today? <laughs> it's like, I'm going the opposite way in a sense because I'm trying to make things easier and more fun. That's just really resonates with me when you said the, the reason people hate running is because they run too fast and they do. And that can be with cycling and swimming and everything. So it's like, how do you make it fun? And Mm -hmm. for me, that's been not having to be, you know, attached to the hip to every single goal that I'm trying to get after. I just like, if I don't feel it, I I let my, myself, you know, back down a little bit. And it's kind of fun to be able to back down and just keep going Mm -hmm. rather than burn out and fade away. Whoa. It's a song, right? Yeah. I think if it's not, it should be. Maybe it can be our well, first that's actually uh, better to burn, burn, out, and burn out and fade away. <laughs> um, the story of uh, most triathletes, <laughs> burn out and fade away. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we don't want that for you. We do we want you to keep it uh, happy and healthy regardless of the journey you're on. Again, I'll talk in more specifics. I think this is a great overview and a great place to start. Again, because I think short courses, is, is, uh, it's not sexy for a lot of people, but it's super sexy. I mean, I... I encourage our athletes and I encourage you to, to subscribe to the, the, the ITU, uh, I think it's a world triathlon app and watch all the racing. There's just so much learning. The athletes are, I mean, they're unreal. They're unreal. They're dropping 10 K's at, you know, four, four plus under five minute pace after they bike fast and, and swim faster than any other athlete. I mean, it's just, it's insane. And you learn so much and I think you appreciate how different they all look and, and how fast they really are and how great the sport is no matter what distances it is. And I, I think that's something that we've forgotten along the way. I think I've forgotten it along the way sometimes. Um, so we hope that the next two podcasts and what we produce this year can, can kind of help regalvanize and, uh, and fire up that, uh, that aspect of the sport. Um, but as always, we love you. We appreciate you. Uh, we appreciate your patience. We, we love your support. Go to our website, c26triathlon.com. It is our one-stop shop for all things coaching camps and community. Click on the coaching tab if you're looking for coaching for the rest of the year or click on the look on the main page for a plan to get you started. Um, the hardest part is getting started, and that's just a fact. You know, we tell our athletes all the time, the, the hardest part of your run is always putting on your shoes. So let us put on your shoes for you this year and guide you along the way. If you need anything from Mike specifically, he's available, crushingiron at gmail.com. Or if you need anything from me specifically, I'm at c26coach at gmail.com. All right, buddy, go have some fun, man. All right, man. See you later. See you later.